Hello everyone. Um, happy Thursday to all of you old kids and new kids. It's weird when um, when you guys are all joining into the um, the broadcast. I can see like all the names and there's all the old school guys and there's the new kids on the block as well. So um, welcome everyone, whether you have been online on one of these before or not. Um, as most of you will know, um, next hour we're going to be editing in Capture One. We're actually going to start with something um, a bit different about backups and storage and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in general terms, um, we're going to get going into editing your pictures um, and we'll uh, we'll go through some of the changes um, that you've made and then some of the things that we might want to uh, tweak, let's say, um, to try and get the best out of every image. So um, for all of you that are joining and you are all over the place again, so from um, Alan down in, as he calls it, Sticky Perth, um, right the way across to Jerry in his uh, in his camper van, um, and G Jim actually wins. Jim is by the pool today, um, so well done, Jim. Um, you get the uh, special prize for best location to be watching one of these. Um, right. So Capture One, um, obviously the software that's available right now is version 21. Um, so that version and that release is uh, current. It's 21.0.2. Um, obviously new releases get um, brought out as and when they're uh, available but that's the version that we're running on today if your version is version 20 you're probably okay in terms of most of the stuff that we're going to do today apart from maybe dehaze is going to be as applicable to you as it is to any of the current um, versions if you want to upgrade go to captureone.com have a look in your account and it'll give you that option um, if you are on a version that's older than version 20 which is actually version 13 you might want to look at the upgrade options because there's been quite a lot of changes since uh, version 12 as it was um, through until now. So unlike normally, we're not going to go straight into Capture One. Um, and the reason is because I actually forgot to do something a while ago, which is talk about backups. So backups, big words. That means it's really, really, really important up there. Um, so, uh, and actually we'll make a point here. Jeff, yes, you are late. There you go. You get a special thing on the screen saying you're late, but it's okay. Um, so, backups and syncing and storage and organization and all the other stuff that goes with it. What I can't do, and what we're not going to do today, is talk you through your individual setup, your own circumstances, and your budget for setting up a backup. What I can do is show you what we do. Um, how that all works, because apart from obviously in recent times, I'm away from home and away from my office and whatever for a long, long um, period of time. So I've got commercial content on memory cards and stuff, which is very worrying if it goes missing. Um, and we're going to run through some of the contents that we use, and hopefully that will give you guys a bit of an idea um, of how to get the best out of keeping your data safe. So first off, some principles, sorry, um, quick theory time. The good news is there are only six of these screens and they're very, very simple. So number one, general rule, and this applies to anything in um, anything IT based. Um, so this doesn't just apply to Capture One. This would apply to your own data, your home memories, your, I don't know, spreadsheets or, or financial stuff as well. The best practice is to keep three copies in two locations or more. So, the, and I see this all the time. Someone says to me, oh yeah, I've got five copies of this backup. Well, where are they? Or oh, they're all in that drawer. That's not going to help you if that drawer disappears or gets set on fire or gets burgled or, or whatever else. So three copies, great. Two locations, that's the most important bit. So if one location gets compromised or damaged, it's not going to hurt you. Second principle, um, cloud stuff. So cloud services, hmm. Cloud is great. So whether that's you know Dropbox, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, whatever you want to use as your cloud service. But treat it as volatile. Treat it like a memory card. Um, a lot of people got tripped up. Oh, God. Last year, I can't remember when, um, I think it was Adobe had a problem with one of their cloud services and files were irreparably deleted um, off of their cloud service. So cloud is great. It means you've got accessibility wherever you are. It's great for getting files from wherever you are to home, and you'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's volatile. Don't treat that as one of your safe backups. It's a copy. Here's the shocker. Um, I don't use Capture One's backup. So in Capture One, you have the option and the function to be able to do a backup of your catalog. And actually, Capture One will automatically prompt you to do that and so on. What it's backing up is not your image files, so just be very clear on that. It is backing up your previews and your adjustments and the metadata and all of that stuff. 
it is not backing up your actual photos. And a lot of people get tripped up because they think they've got a backup of it when it gets corrupted or their photo goes um, gets deleted. No, you don't. The Capture One backup is backing up your adjustments and your metadata. It's not backing up the original RAWs. So I don't use Capture One's backup. The reason is because I've got, a, a for me, a better way of, of working with it outside of that. And golden rule, expect to lose data. Hard drives fail, SSDs fail, um, memory cards fail, all of that stuff. So just expect to lose data. And if, if you're expecting it, you'll behave slightly differently when it comes to looking after uh, where files are being sent. So practically, in the field, this is how, and again, this isn't necessarily the right answer. This is just an answer that works for me. So, and, and just to give you some idea, it's not a cheap option. <laughs> memory cards. I never wipe them. So I'll burn through a memory card, and that memory card will be kept for that shoot. Now, that's a very expensive way of doing things. But what I have is effectively two card slots. And those card slots, um, one of the cards is an SD, the other is a CF Express or XQD. One of them I keep forever, the cheaper one, frankly, the SD. The XQD will recycle, will re reuse for every different shoot. But the SD cards get hived off and stored and never overwritten. SanDisk make these. Um, Extreme Pro SSDs. Other brands are available, blah, 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 of course. Um, but these are fantastic. They are, you know, they're rugged, they're splash proof. I wouldn't necessarily call them completely waterproof, but they they can be um, covered in water. Um, and they're one terabyte, two terabyte, four terabyte drives. And they're fantastic and they're fast and they just plug straight into your laptop and they behave almost like it's an internal drive. Um, again, for one trip, especially if it's a commercial shoot, one trip equals one drive. And again, never wiped. Local laptop storage, obviously. So when we're out and about, we've got my MacBook or whatever, that's got local storage on it as well. So those are my three items. But they're obviously all in the same place with me. So whenever I'm connected, we'll connect up to, and in this case, we have a Dropbox plan. It's a business plan, so it's got, I can't remember how much space, um, but a lot. And my laptop, whenever it's on the network, in one way or another, is going to sync everything that I capture, all the raw data and my Capture One files, up to the cloud. Now, how's it doing that? And this is one thing that a lot of people struggle with in terms of their organization. There is a difference in Capture One between the file system structure and your Capture One if you're using them catalog structure. This applies to sessions as well as it does to catalogs in, in that sense. If you want to think about sessions versus catalogs, that's a different story to today. For every location or every shoot, I've got one master folder. So let's say I'm going to, oh, where are we are? Brian, there you go. Brian's in Wyoming. So um, let's say I'm heading out to Wyoming. So I'll create a master folder, which is um, today's date. So year, month, day. There's a reason we do it that way, because it's easier to search through, unfortunately. Um, so the American date format doesn't work for searching. Um, I can sort things very quickly by their exact date order, as long as I do the fold or folder names in year, month, day can't do it if you do year day month or month day year um, it's much easier to do it this way so in that master folder that says 2021-02 where are we 25 dash wyoming in there will then have days so from that first day all those different days which means i've got a clean way of getting memory card information into my computer one catalog and i'm using catalogs again remember you don't have to this can apply to sessions but I put that in that root master folder, so in that Wyoming master folder. All the edits for every single one of those shots in that shoot are held in that catalog. So effectively, I've got a catalog per shoot. Not per day, but per shoot. And then when we're done, we have a finals catalog, and I'll talk about that in a second when we come home. So hopefully that sort of makes sense. There's a, there's a logical progression that says, here is a shoot, it has a master folder, in there are each day's files, and they get um, imported into each catalog that I have for each shoot. Then it comes to transportation. So let's hope that you've managed to do some cloud backup. When you're putting your stuff together in your bag, and I took, there was a Capture One video we had to do about uh, 10 months ago, talking about exactly this, actually. So you'll find it on the Capture One channel somewhere. 
But the three over two thing still applies. And the number of times I see this, so someone says, right, great, I've got my three backups and I'm going to put them in my hand luggage because that's the safest place to store my memory cards. They won't get damaged. And then they leave their hand luggage behind on the plane, which I have seen happen, or they leave it in the airport, or it gets damaged, or whatever. Um, you've put all your eggs in that one basket. If you're checking luggage, check one of your copies too. Check one of these in your, in your check luggage. It's one of your three copies. It's not the end of the world if it disappears, because you have another two. But at least it's in a different location, a different method to getting it home. Some people I know, and I've I've done it before, will courier um, a copy of it um, back home just in case something goes wrong with luggage or hand luggage or whatever. Um, and you can use that cloud method to mitigate against all of that. So cloud is great, as I say, as a transport thing, as a backup backup, but don't rely on it purely. Okay. Backups and sync. So I am on a Mac, as you'll, you'll be familiar. Um... There's a fantastic tool, nothing to do with me. I've just used it for so many years. It's, it's great, called Chronosync. Um, and we have schedules set up. So effectively, while I'm out and about, uh, um, out in, let's say, Wyoming, I'm updating my files to Dropbox. We have a script that runs back at base that synchronizes the Dropbox cloud, which is public, effectively, if I want it to be, through to our own network storage, which is a private cloud too. So by the time I get home, all of my files not only are sat on Dropbox, they're also sat on our local um, NAS or our local or cloud. Then the Mac computers directly have their own independent time machine backup. So this is a system backup. Nothing to do with pictures, just the system. That's using Apple's time machine. Nothing more complicated than that. But that's going on to a different NAS. So we've got two different network storages, one for images, one for machine backups. We keep them separate. And then every month, again, I told you this isn't the cheapest option, but every month there's an off-site monthly backup taken. Why? Now let's think about this. All of the stuff that we've got, so I've still got my original memory card, I've still got the uh, the originals on, a, on an SSD, but files can get corrupted. And the beauty of a cloud system and a network attack storage system is that synchronization happens almost instantly. So when a file gets corrupted, that can also happen instantly by having a monthly backup, a physical off-site drive backup, I can always go back to before that happened. So again, each of these bits, you need to choose which bits you want to invest in. But this means, frankly, I am never worried about losing an image. If someone says to me, do you have that file from 2014? Sometimes it takes me a, a while to, get, to try and find it. But Chances are I have, and if not, I can get to it. I'm not worried. And that finals catalog I talked about. So we've got a structure with all of our raw files on that NAS and on Dropbox and on those drives. Every image which is a final picture. So in other words, when I'm happy with the edit, we leave the edit where it is in its raw location with its raw file and that catalog for that shoot. But we'll then export the EIP and a TIFF file and we'll import that into one master finals catalog, which we have it's held centrally. So I've got one big catalog, which has every finished image that we've ever published, produced, licensed, anything. That's in a finals folder, and that stays pretty much at base. I can access it wherever I am because of all that cloud stuff, but its master is back at home. While I'm out and about, we're not dealing with that finals catalog unless I need to grab something. We're dealing with those raw folders. So, we did it again, sorry, theory session. Um, however, hopefully, that sort of makes sense. Um, it's about spreading risk. It's about thinking about when this fails. Don't think about if it fails, when it fails. It's funny, I think, what was it, Brian, I think, has just said, um, jinx himself, thinking he hadn't had a card failure since 2006 and been expecting one ever since. It's the best way to be. Assume your cards are going to fail. Assume you're going to lose data. If you work on that basis, when it happens, you've already thought this through. You already know. So when I, if I have a memory card fail, A, I've got two cards in my camera. B, that night or the previous night, I already shelved it across to one of these. And in the meantime, overnight, it was already copying that across to the cloud. So it doesn't matter. If my laptop gets stolen, touch wood-ish, um, 
it doesn't really matter because all that stuff is already somewhere else. And that's that three over two thing. Um, so, question, a couple of questions. Um, oh, Van, sorry. 2016 was a bad year for me. I had three hard drives fail in the course of six months. Lost all my photos. Yeah. Um, honestly, but, you know, it's funny. People are like, you know, hard drives are awful. They'll fail. So do these. SSDs also fail. They have a finite number of writes and reads. They're getting better, but they can also fail. So assume they're going to and have more than one copy. That's the key thing. Um, Tom, there you go, who wondered about the workflow. Honestly, that's it. It's as simple as that. Um, and if, you, if, if anyone's confused, just sort of watch this back. But think about a folder per shoot. In there is a folder per day. That lot is what we're using when we're out and about. And it's synchronized elsewhere. When we come back to base, it's all amalgamated, and we've got that finals catalog, which is the, the finished one. Um, Jose, after time, do you only keep originals and remove bracketings in terms of storage volume? Honestly, no. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, I, I used to many years ago. What I've found is the cost of storage comes down faster than I can build a, a big library of, of images, um, which actually, funnily enough, goes on to Jim's point, which is what's the average total megabytes per shoot. Uh, it Honestly, it depends. Uh, my RAWs are about 150 to 180 meg um, for each RAW. I can fill easily, I don't know, 528 gig cards or 120 gig cards as they are on, on Sony um, within a shoot, no worries. But again, it's it's one of these. It's a terabyte drive. Um, and our NAS storage, if I want to plug in another drive, we'll plug in another drive. Yes, it all comes with cost. That's the one thing to bear in mind. What I'm what I'm talking about isn't a cheap or a, a, a quick solution. It, it, it works, but it's invested. Um, uh, and where are we? Hans, uh, so you're making the IP from all exported files. Yes, so we make actually several different um, exports. One is the EIP, and that's so that I can go back and adjust raw information. Um, I got caught out a while ago when I used to we used to only ever export TIFFs um, and discard the EIP effectively. Um, and I'd have to then go and hunt and root. Now, for every image that's final, we have an EIP, a full-size TIFF, so for large format printing, and a smaller size TIFF with different sharpening for a smaller size printing or for on-screen. Um, so there we go. Um, ooh, 17 minutes in. Let's get into Capture One. Um, for any other questions on um, all the backup stuff, we can cover them along the way. As normal, um, put your stuff into the comments. Uh, it takes about seven or eight seconds for me to see it. Um, I'm effectively a little bit in the future. Um, but yeah, um, let's make it as interactive as we can. And to that point, Peter's question, what about your backups after 20 plus years? Yep, still got them. Um, what, without, without sort of playing around with it, um, in all honesty, we don't have the hard drives from 20 plus years ago. What we have though, is a certain point that says those monthly offsite backups after probably about four or five years, it's safe to assume that nothing bad is, is going on in the past. So it gets amalgamated and we, we push it forward. Um, so I can, I still, if someone says to me, do you have that image from, well, where are we? 1998 or something like that. Yeah, somewhere. I'll find it. Um, we, we have it on, on drives. It's on our NAS. Um, and the advantage with modern solutions, and this is the, the key thing, modern network storage, you can just keep adding and adding and adding. And the prices are coming down enough to make it worth it um, to invest in a good one uh, with lots and lots of slots. That's one thing. Get one with lots of empty slots because you'll fill them. Okay, uh, so capture one. Um, here we go, our familiar interface. Um, so this is a shot from Brian. This is where we ended last week. Um, and Brian's uh, question was whether or not we can keep the feeling of a snowstorm or flurry in this shot without necessarily losing um, any of the detail and the clarity and the, um, the sharpness in some of this stuff. If I'm honest... <sighs> Photographing snowstorms is a is a challenge when they're quite flat like this. Um, if you've got a snowstorm that's sort of whipped up a shape in the sky and, and some cloud formations and stuff, it, it can be a little bit easier. Um, in 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 this this sort of term, it's effectively little specks um, that are falling down in, in front of us. So we want to keep that feeling. We want to keep the wintry feeling, but 
we also want to get some clarity out of this. So I'm just going to do a quick before and after swipe because one of the things that Brian mentioned is we've got two versions of this. We've got this version here, which is the auto curve, and then we've got the linear response version of the same shot. In fact, there's one difference as well between the two, which is the linear response does not or does have distortion correction, whereas our auto one, interesting, does not and will not let us enable it. That's fun, isn't it? Um, that is weird. Okay, so I'm um, just for the sake of uh, doing it in completeness, we're going to uh, turn off our distortion correction. I'm going to have a look at that later on in terms of why um, why we're there. Um, but we've got the auto curve, which you can see is a lot brighter. We can see the peaks in this histogram as well. So the you know the whites have been really pushed up because that auto curve is designed to add some contrast into it. Um, Brian's just asking, would a strobe help? <laughs> I I've done this. Um, it will, but you tend to find it picks up too much. There's no, <laughs> there's no medium um, amount. So what you've got, if you're genuinely in the middle of a snowstorm, um, you end up effectively whiting out the the front and the foreground. So be careful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, be be careful with using a strobe. You can overdo it effectively. Um, one question before we carry on. Just want um, so. When out on a shoot, how many people do you have with you to help with all this backing up? So it depends. Um, we can be on a shoot with four or five people. Um, one of the last shoots we did before lockdown was, I think, that. Um, or it can be me out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I've got, remember I mentioned that Chronosync um, function. So on my laptop basically is a load of schedules that sit within Chronosync. Um, when I copy a memory card onto that laptop... The second I plug in one of these, and here's a little handy tip, it's going to sound odd, I call these all the same name. Helps with locating in catalogs. Um, when I plug in one of these, Chronosync recognizes it and does a copy across to that, and it also does a copy across to Dropbox the second um, it sees a network connection as well. Um, so it can be done solo. I, I don't actually have to do much other than copy the files across. Um, so yeah, Brian, in terms of uh, strobe, it will help, but it's going to flare up all of that stuff um, that's right in front of your eyes and maybe block out some of the background. So we want to get a feel where this is nice and sharp, all of this detail, but still you've got the idea that you're in a snowstorm, so sort of more like this out here. And certainly down here is is probably distracting a little bit. Um, the linear response curve, as you can see, it's calmer, and we can look at this histogram in the top left, look at how much that shifts. So it's squashed more in the middle. It's it's not quite as contrasty, not quite as hot in the in the highlights, but it has lost some of that um, that punch, let's call it, um, that this one gives us. So let's create a clone of this variant, and I'm just going to do these as two different colors so we can uh, compare. So we're going to stick with the auto curve, and at the moment we've already got this function in here called rocks, which is basically putting color into these rocks areas down here. So it's warming them up a little bit. Um, and we've already done, well, sorry, Brian has already done a lot of work in the background in terms of pulling down the highlights, pulling down the whites. So bearing in mind, if we hadn't done that, the auto curve is going to deliver slightly over the top results in the top of that screen. So let's leave that there. Um, by the way, remember, whenever you want to temporarily see the action that a, a tool has done, all you've got to do is hold down the Option key and hold down the Reset button on each individual tool. Um, don't let go of the Option key, otherwise it will reset it. If you do, it's fine. You can just undo in the top. So we've got this pulled down up here, which is our highlights and our whites. We've got a clarity boost. Let's just undo that so you can see. So it's quite subtle. But if we look at these trees, it's had quite a decent effect on it, in fact. There to there. Pretty good. But we want to make these the star of the show. Maybe lose some of this detail down here. Up here is looking pretty good already. So let's create a new layer called foreground. Not the same as rocks. And I'm going to put a little gradient in. So a soft edged gradient. So the, the way that we make a gradient or softer in terms of its fall off is you make this distance between the 100% line and the 0% line, the middle being 50, greater. So as we do, we just pull it down. 
because I want this to be a quite a subtle change. And shock horror, we're going to use the dehaze tool, um, but we're not going to use it as intended, of course. We're going to use it um, on white to rehaze some of that. And I'm also going to pull down the exposure a little bit on that foreground. So if we look at what that's done, it's taken us from having this quite detailed, you know, colorful, um, but but clear uh, and contrasty foreground. And we've washed that out a little bit. Now, if that's too much, we can always back off that layer. So you've got the opacity in the top left of the screen. We can always pull down that opacity. So every effect that we've done is always going to be at 100% by default. We can back it off. What we can't do is add more opacity. So some people ask, you know, why do we do it um, in a certain way? I would tend to use the tool. So in other words, these adjustments a bit more than you need because you can always back off the opacity of that tool later on if you choose. If you know exactly where you want it to be, then fine. Leave it exactly at 100% and exactly where you want the, the adjustment to be. But if you're not sure or you're playing with it, I might want a bit more, a bit less. Nothing wrong, actually, with setting this to 50% making all of your adjustments down here and then you can add some more and remove some without having to go into each individual tool to do it so that can help um, if you want to play with that um, i am going to pull down the highlight recovery and the white recovery a bit so what we've got is effectively a faded out foreground just slightly um, just to make sure that we're not drawing attention down to here and then with the trees well there's a couple of ways we can do it one way of, of course it's um and again, let's be very careful not to uh, create clarity over the entire image because we want to make sure the subject's here. So with our brush and a right click, I'm choosing 100% opacity, 100% flow. Um, and we're literally going to just fill these trees up with lots and lots of mask. Um, a soft brush, or brush edge. So I've got the hardness set to zero means that we've got a nice fall off on the outside. If I want to taper this in a little bit, I could do it with a softer brush edge. Or I can go to my eraser, leave the hardness down, leave the opacity down, and just edge in with this. The secret to trying to blend in any adjustments is to not have lines. Now, it's going to obviously sound a little bit um, obvious when you think about it, but the amount of times it's obvious to see an adjustment because there's a straight line. Um, and, and the eye is drawn to lines and shapes whenever it's looking at something. So the idea is if we can just subtly boost up certain aspects of the image rather than that absolute line that goes across it, it's going to look more natural, um, more real and more accurate to what you was there than if you have this sort of hard line across the top and hard line across the bottom and everything below it is clear and everything above it is, is not. That, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so with that line, we can use clarity and we can push it a lot more in this. Where these are already effectively black and white and they're already sitting in the middle, we've got a lot of latitude to push clarity. But there's another tool that we can use here which might help us, which is levels. So rather than using clarity here, we can darken down these dark parts of the trees. And remember, we're only playing with this part of the image, not the top, not the bottom. And I can also brighten up some of that snow. So again, we're going to temporarily undo levels. So move your mouse over the undo button on the levels tool on the left. Hold down the option key or alt. And while you're holding it down, click the mouse. So that's before, that's after. So now we've got a lot more detail in these snowflakes that are coming in without having to resort to clarity. The downside of clarity and structure, and we've talked about this before, on high contrast points, they'll create halos, as, as we call them. Halo doesn't necessarily always mean light. It can be dark as well. But you can use um, levels to effectively stretch out those midtones. Again, only in the area that we've masked. So it's only applying to this area here. It's not changing anything down here or anything up there. But with all that change, we've got all this extra contrast without those lines that can come as a result of structure or overdoing clarity. What that's done is it's made this bit down here look a little bit too washy um, for my eyes. So I'm going to go back to my foreground layer. And rather than using some exposure dropping, I'm going to actually increase our contrast slightly. Um, but remove a bit more of that haze color as well. Okay, so 
we've got a little bit of wash out here, a lot more strong there, and then washed out at the top. This is too strong for me. I'm going to pull this back just a touch again using the opacity of that layer rather than going into every single one of these um, sliders and having to adjust it because what it may do is later on I might come back and think hmm I want that a bit more dramatic rather than having to think about what I was doing with the sliders I can just ramp up or ramp down the layer opacity to have more or less of an effect um, and to me that's sort of where I'd leave it Brian to be honest um, the the risk is otherwise you're in danger of putting in so much detail to be able to see the snow um, that you're going to end up sort of overdoing it. Um, now, this is the, the beforehand. And to me, this is one of the distracting points, this color that's in here. And I know you warmed it up, so I'm wondering whether you wanted that as a feature. Um, but in here, you know, I could even... Oops, wrong layer, foreground. I could even darken down those shadows a bit. So the rock is still a feature. The rock has still got detail. But we're bringing the eye up to this forest um, with all the snow that's going on in there, um, rather than the slightly washed out version. Um, so, a couple of where are we? A couple of questions. So, uh, Jose, we capture one. Is it possible to send the shoot to two different locations simultaneously, like computer and external drive? Um, yeah, yeah. So Jim, Jim's already there. Yes, uh, so you can set up a, a second location on import. Um, what a lot of people actually do is they'll have um, watched folders and monitored folders, so you can um, you can have scripts that run in the background that actually monitor a certain folder. When it sees something getting put into it, it can um, effectively hive it off to another place as well um, at the same time. Um, Mia is saying, "How does the sharpness tool work? Uh, does it sharpen the full image or working on an algorithm?" Enhancing only what is in focus. Uh, so the sharpening in Capture One is effectively a, a version of edge detection and contrast enhancement. So it will add sharpness or perceived sharpness by increasing the definition at an edge um, of wherever a, a contrast line is drawn. Um, there is actually, Paul has just uh, mentioned, so there's a whole, there's a 20 minute, um, what we call them pro tips um, videos that goes in depth into what each of the sharpening tools do because there are several so you've got clarity which is a form of, of sharpening and contrast enhancement structure is another sharpening itself is another and then within sharpening you've got a lot of um, settings so if we go across to here these settings the amount radius threshold and so on you're you're going to need to know um, so have a look at that video it, it might answer most of the questions um, yes um, and then brian do i edit go get a coffee then come back and look at your work again um so, no, um, but here's a weird one. What I will try and do, unless I'm um, in a in a weird place and or with a deadline, um, I won't edit on the day that I shoot. Funnily enough, I've done it a few times recently when I've I've gone out to shoot and gone, wow, I want that. Um, so we've we've edited straight away. Um, but because a lot of the, what we do is for print. And for a print on someone's wall, I will purposefully come away from that shoot, back everything up, um, and then a few days later, if not even weeks later, go back and edit the photos. The reason is, I need to remove my memory, sounds weird, from that shot to make sure I'm producing a print that works. Where, um, where we have a... A connection to an image that's important because that's effectively what we're selling we're selling at that moment in time that that memory but it means that you've got a, a bias towards certain um, images and what tends to happen is the selections you're making the choices you're making of which of the images that you took is the best changes over time and if you spend time away let that memory fade a little bit and then come and look at the images as a print rather than as oh i remember that at nine o'clock this morning you might make a slightly different decision um so that's what we've uh, I've, I've learned to do and there we go i thought that might be the case so the rocks are the stars so everything i've done to remove the rocks is not very good however very simple um sorry we can just remove that foreground layer so if we want again working on layers if we want these rocks to be the stars then we just take that foreground layer off um or if anything what we can do, of course, is reset our foreground layer. So here's an interesting one. Uh, da, da, da. 
and I'm going to actually use our dehaze tool a tiny bit, not too much, but if we really want those rocks to be the stars, let's clean them up. Um, let's make them stand out even more. Um, and off we go. So again, it depends on what you want the feeling of this shot to be. If the key is this pop of color in amongst that storm, then great. And if we want to do that again, even more, we could go even higher, which is let's go and create a new layer called sky, another gradient mask. And I'm actually going to draw it over here. And that same principle we did before with dehaze, I'm going to rehaze. Sounds weird, rehaze. Um, but anyway, so that's our haze color there. So if we want to, we can add in more of that storm. If we really want to bring the viewer's attention down to here, then let's add some more layers in there. And one of the ways of layering is you can use the, the dehaze tool to a negative value, and that'll give you more of a um, cloudy effect all the way through. It, for those that are on version 20 rather than version 21, you don't have this dehaze tool. What you do have, have however, is negative clarity, and you can play a little bit with curves. So by, by pulling down this middle curve here, uh, it's just, um, let's re uh, let's not reset it. Let's just go back to zero. If I reset it, it might reset the shadow color. Um, so my area up here, if I want to reduce contrast, I'm using the Luma curve here. Um, all I need to do is effectively just pull this curve down and you'll see a similar effect happening up there. So again, without and with, some people prefer the curve way of working. I often do. It gives me a bit of a, a bit more control. But that or the negative dehaze, either one works fine. Okay, so that's sort of where we're at. Uh, Brian, on the strobe front, honestly, give it a try. Um, when I've done it before in snow, it's been a bit too... Um, what's the word? It's almost like someone put a, 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 like a, a spatter brush in Photoshop and went on the front of the image so it can look a little bit weird um, look a little bit digital but give it a try um, see where it is okay um, and Tom just said yeah excellent I'll take on edit time rediscovered prior images after years so here's a here's a little secret um, obviously for the last 10 months or 11 months I haven't been shooting as much as I used to um, I've actually spent a lot of the time going back um, over previous shoots, some shoots I'd even forgotten that I'd done. Um, that's how, because I remember coming away from the, the location thinking, oh, that was a bust. I've now looked at it and I've got a huge catalogue of images, which now looking at them with fresh eyes, having come away from it. And it's interesting, if you went to a location expecting 100% and you came away with 50, you're disappointed. You don't think that those, or don't think positively of those images. Go away for a while. Don't look at them. Leave them. Um, come back in six months' time and have a look again. Because had you not gone to that location with that expectation and that perspective, you might have found that the images you took actually were just as impressive. They just weren't what you were hoping for. Um, and then going back in time, maybe, um, maybe you find something different. Okay. Um, and Martin's, yeah, haze. <laughs> Um, maybe it's not rehaze. Maybe it's just haze. Um, yeah, is it though? Because it's it wasn't haze there in the first place. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Um, so let's go on to Alan. So Alan's question that he sent in was basically: This is his edit. Um, how are we doing? Um, and so this is our before. This is our after. Um, and in general terms, pretty good. Um, there are a couple of things that I might want to tweak, Alan, um, in there. And I thought we'll run through now, but mostly it looks you know, looks pretty good. If I loaded that up without seeing the before, I'd be pretty happy. Um, looks looks positive. Looks like it's done well. So the couple of things. Um, number one, in the sky, and this is a hundred percent personal preference. And I can see all the layers that you've created in here. Um, in in terms of as well reducing the yellow in the sky, uh, which is this area here. And what's interesting is. To me, the one color that's now missing out of the sky is this slight blue, um, slight pinky blue sort of color. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, we could use um, a bit of that um, back in there. Um, the other thing to be careful with on here, for instance, if we're saying reducing the yellow in the sky, I don't think it's had an issue on your image, but do be careful. If you're doing a local adjustment in one area of the image, do a local adjustment in that one area of the image. 
even though you've said reduce yellow in sky, and that's done effectively through our yellow color editor in here, taking that saturation down, so all the right stuff. Because the mask applies to the entire image, if there was a piece of yellow down here that was meant to be saturated, it's going to go as well. So typically I'd recommend changing that mask if you do want to do the yellow in the sky to just cover the sky. It's still going to have the same effect on this area here, but you're removing the risk of affecting any, anything else. Okay, um, the sky darkening piece um, is coming from the back of our background layer has got some changes made to it. Um, and a lot of it is actually bringing up the highlights and the shadows. So normally we'd recover highlights and shadows. In this case, the background has them pushed up a little bit. So if I were to undo this temporarily, like that, um, we've pulled up all of this um, this detail in here from what was there before. Um, but I, I just I struggle a little bit with what's gone on up here because I want some of that color back. Um, if I'm honest, I, I, I miss um, I miss seeing some some of the color um, up in the top. So my temptation on here would be maybe. Um, what have we got here as well? The orange, oh, the color editing on the, on the sea, this bit here. Maybe we want to bring some of that sky back. Um, and, and it's not a case of darkening it. It's this, it's this layer here. Um, and it's just been pushed maybe a little bit, little bit too dramatic um, in there. So, um, oh, sorry, Paul has just spent, yeah, it's, it's a fair point. Um, so whenever you're editing um, the sky in terms of reflections, so remember with water, you also get the reflection. Whatever is up here will have an element of reflection down here. In this particular case, it hasn't been too much of an issue, but absolutely, when you look at it, there's a bit more yellow in here than there was up there. There it's been reduced now, there it hasn't. Overall, we take down the yellow. Just just keep an eye on what you're editing. Does there, or is it a reflection in existence of that color or that change? And if there is, you might want to include it. So to be complete, um, if we're doing this properly, um, because this is a reflection of the sky, yet yeah, we could absolutely add in this area here and take that same yellow out of there. Okay, um, so up top, um, in terms of our background, let me just... Uh, why are we getting something, something very strange going on there to my eye, but okay. Um, and it's, is it coming from the darkened sky? yeah okay um and it's coming from this issue here right so number one i want to get a bit of color back in the sky um what i might want to do then effectively in this darkened sky have we maybe pulled out not sure where we are no we haven't in darkened sky have we in background no so we've literally just got a bit of a, a shift in the sky I'd be tempted to pull some of that back in, but it depends on what you wanted. The second part of this, and we'll come back to the sky uh, in a second, is this area here. Now, if I look at the original, there isn't a, a light ridge here, and the light ridge doesn't really make sense. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge down here. Um, so it doesn't quite make sense that we've got this sort of brightening towards the bottom sometimes you can get it with sea haze or sea mist um but it's it's not that because if we look in the raw that that didn't really exist where it's coming from and i found this earlier let me just try and make sure i'm getting this right uh it was this shadow enhancement here so by pulling up the shadows to get this foreground up we've effectively created let me just do that again so you can see this halo here and it's where it's meeting the border between the genuinely dark part of the sea and the sort of i guess mid-tone as i move my mouse around along here this is pretty much a mid-tone um up here it's a lower mid-tone but it is in the mid-tones the sea wasn't so unfortunately as a result of using this global sort of shadow lift we have impacted part of that over there so there's a couple of ways that we can deal with it um one way is to brush that out uh, let's just have a little play with that. So let's go into here and 
on our background layer rather than doing this actually I'm going to do it slightly differently um, rather than doing this on a massive background layer if we want to do those adjustments what we can do is create a new filled layer and we're going to call it foreground whoops I can't type today there we go um, Brighton so with our background layer, we have our increase of 5385 minus 3017. So we'll go 5385 minus 3017. And I'm going to reset all of this on my background. So I've got the same effect applied as if I'd done it on my background layer. But with this layer here, it's a mask. So I can actually, if I turn this off, you'll see the difference. I can actually remove things from the mask and my temptation would be to remove this island here um, from it so we can if we want to and this is going to take a little bit of time if we wanted to do it completely accurately um, but we can just scrub this out so let's put our opacity quite a way up we can scrub this out from our mask so i'm not going to do it all the way along but you'll see the uh, you'll see the effect so here we go, scrubbing all that out. And then as we've gone over the C here, of course, we can use an eraser or we can actually do a bit more accurately. We can go and make this a little bit smaller. Um, sorry, go to our brush, make this brush a little bit smaller. And we're going to click over here on the left. And we're going to click over here on the right. Oops, where are we? Thank you. Am I not set to opacity? There we go, opacity 100. So click here and hold down the shift key between lines. So between those clicks and you get a straight line drawn across. So for those of you that didn't know that, um, if I click in one location, hold down the shift key, click in another location, you get a straight line between the two rather than having to draw the mask. If we want to really show you that, um, if I were to go to here and draw, there's our squirrely line. If I click here, hold down the shift key and click here, I get a straight line between the two. So don't forget that one. It can be really handy for things like horizons. But you see the point. We can very, very quickly start to build a mask around that. I wouldn't use a Luma range because in the original thing here, it's going to be difficult to separate that out. We can try it. So let's just fill that back in. Um, it's going to be very difficult to do because the luma range needs to be in the middle forget i said that um we can't separate out at the moment a luma range between the two we can't have like a dip and say select the top and select the bottom we'd have to create two layers and create two luma ranges that exclude this middle um, part here so it's actually going to be easier in this case um, just to draw a mask but you see the point so i've left this intentionally not going all the way along so you can see the difference it looks a little bit unnatural to have this sort of uh, margin at the bottom when actually it should be a silhouette, it's backlit, it should feel like a, a piece of headland sticking out. So that's the only thing. Um, and up here on the top, we could, um, let's just create our quick um, sky. Even with all those adjustments made, we could bring in just a little bit more of that blue color back to there, which feels like it's more related to the original shot down there. Um, I don't know whether the intention, Alan, was to keep it really warm, um, but I, I'm just one of those people, when I see a bit of blue in the sky, it's nice to keep it. But again, that's personal preference. So generally speaking, no issues. Um, be careful with what you're affecting when you're trying to make a specific change, like the yellow. As I think it was Paula said, be careful as well to factor in reflection. So if you're changing something in the sky, you need to also adjust that same thing in the in the reflection. Be careful on these boundaries. When you do heavy HDR recovery, you can introduce these margins or halos or whatever you want to call them. So it might be worth masking them out, just like I did there. Use the straight line um, tool to get your horizon back. You can also use the auto mask element around the edge. But in this case, you don't need to be quite that accurate because um, it's not going to notice on, on, on the blend. Um, and then with the sky, it's a personal thing. I would just keep that blue in there a little bit more. Um, but if you choose not to, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's, in, that's entirely up to you. Okay, where are we, Scott? Uh, so Scott's problem. So again, 
<clears throat> it's a good edit. Um, I, I'm pretty pleased with this edit. It looks quite well, quite nice. Um, we've got a bit of an autumn effect on there, which we said we'll try and cover um, over the next couple of weeks. But the question that Scott had specifically, other than you know, does it does it work? And I'd say yes, it does. The only thing actually, I'd be tempted to do a little bit more. You've already done some of it down here in the wave. Um, but if I create a new layer and call it wave two with my little happy brush, we're going to just draw big mask into here and we're really going to get that structure and clarity and tone up there where we've got moving water. Let's use that. Um, so again, you can push that a little bit more. If you want the heaviest amount of clarity, switch from natural to neutral. Neutral won't affect color, but it does affect contrast to quite a heavy extent. So you can really push that wave motion in there. But that wasn't actually um, the, the issue, <laughs> funnily enough. So the issue was around these halos. And I have to admit, I was a little bit perplexed to start with because normally when we see halos like this, so we're talking about this structure here. Normally it comes from either over sharpening or over HDR, as we talked about before, or over clarity and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I started looking at the before, which was in color and after and thinking, well, there's no halo there. There is there. Hmm. Odd. And then I worked it out. And this, to be fair, Scott, it is Scott, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so to be fair, Scott, you almost got me on this one until I found the little thing that um, that actually alluded to it in, in this little um, line here. It's to do with your black and white um, conversion. So if we look at the color version, there isn't much of a halo there. And even with, even if I'd whacked up clarity all the way to the right hand side, we still wouldn't see quite that. We would if we'd over sharpened. But if I look at your sharpening um, layer, there's nothing on here. You know, we haven't we haven't got that. We've got a bit of structure work on there, but that's all been done with the clarity tool other than the background base sharpening amount. And if I use the halo suppression, it's not fixing it. And the reason it's not fixing it is because it's not a sharpening issue. The issue is your black and white conversion, you used the blue slider quite correctly to pull down the detail in the sky and make it look more dramatic. So let's look at it without. So back to zero. That was our sky. So we want to separate the lighthouse and the structure from the sky. So one of the ways of doing that is to bring in those storm clouds, darken down the areas that are blue in the original color image, and you get more contrast. This is the right theory. Good, good move. But see this line here? It's not all the same blue. This is a slightly cyan line. So what Capture One is seeing is this is different to the cloud in the back. And if I pull our cyan down, we can see even more that difference here as well. And it's where it's blending between the black and the cyan that Capture One on its conversion here is struggling because it's like, well, this line in the middle, it's like a bright line of sort of blue, but it's not really blue. It's heading towards gray. Uh, what do I do with this slider? So there are a couple of ways that I found that we can we can play with this. One is we can do this with um, leaving the blue where it was. And instead, if we create a new, let's say, filled adjustment layer, uh, we, I'm just doing this for speed, to be honest. But what we could do is obviously do a, um, a color selection um, as well. That would also do it. Um, but we could pull up the clarity in this layer here and get the same effect almost as if we pulled down the blue. Okay, it's pushing this too much for sure in the foreground, so we need to separate out the sky. And the way to do that would be to create a color range in the sky. But there may be an easier way, um, which is let's leave the blue where it was. Let's remove uh, our adjustment layer up here that I just created. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the um, skin tone tool. You'll love that. So skin tone tool does slightly different things to um, what we're expecting. So it's designed to fix blemishes and changes in color and tone of skin, but it also works on sky. And what we're seeing here is an issue where we've got a change in tone on the sky. So if I go to my skin tone tool and let's create a new filled layer, skin tone, and I'm just going to make sure we're in the blue area here. So I'm going to choose my blue area here. 
it's going to pick it up even though it's in black and white because the underlying data is blue I'm going to say smoothness quite a way around so include all of this cyan stuff that's around there by the way the other thing I looked at was was it fringing um, was it purple defringe um, doing it and it has a little bit of an effect but not a huge amount um, but the skin tone tool we can change the color the uniformity of that sky so let's go to our uniformity here and change it to be more uniform and the saturation more uniform we're losing a little bit of detail we're losing a little bit of the drama but it's worth it to get rid of now if we do lightness you want to see it flatten obviously but it's worth that slight loss of detail coupled with a little bit of purple defringing to remove most of that halo it's not all gone so if we go back to this version it's much better you can see there so if we go side by side so this is the original this is the new remember we're at 400 percent. so let's just go out to 100 percent. you're not going to notice it uh, oops sorry silly me didn't do them together uh where are we let's just zoom out and start all over again with the shift key so when you want to make changes uh to your zoom hold down the shift key unlike what i did and you'll get the same change in both so let's say at 200 percent, you're not going to notice it on the right as much as you do on the left so it's about reducing rather than removing but it's coming from that black and white conversion so that was a bit of a mystery but there it was um and it's all about that border so if i go back to here and you can see if you really look there's a slightly different blue on that border to what there is in the rest of the sky and by pulling that down you've basically made that more detailed more contrasty um, and it's a little more obvious unfortunately that's what capture one's picking up uh, and then finally chris's question so this is already edited this is chris's um so his version of the tiff in there how to make this um, pop a little bit more well to me actually it's pretty much there but I would make a couple of changes so this isn't too different in in terms of the version um, I would make a few changes just to make this really really pop so the first is that white balance on the snow here and the sky we're going to split the two out because if I do a default white balance here on this snow to make the snow more neutral the sky is going to go too warm because it's warming up the image so instead of just leaving it at that so now we have neutral snow which is a little bit better than the sort of greeny tint that we had before we're going to create a new layer call it sky with our graduated filter that we all love we're going to slightly cool down that sky um, and i'm just going to adjust the green in there cool with this tent down in the foreground there's only really one bit of highlight in here so it doesn't really matter what I do in terms of my brushing because as I move my brush around here we can see it's all sat down here in the lower parts of the histogram um, so as I brush over our tent here by picking on highlights there and whites there and I'm going to show you in detail let's just do a temporary undo again so without and with I've only affected the areas that were in the brightest part of the image that that rough brushing over the entire tent really doesn't matter because highlights and, and whites don't exist in the rest of the the area that I've covered um, and then overall we can afford to push our levels a little bit so we can use our levels to pull up our oops sorry that's in our tent layer make sure you're back on your background or a filled layer um, we can pull our levels in a little bit just to brighten up some of that sky we can if we want to add in a bit of clarity and we can also add in a touch of contrast be careful with contrast but a little touch of it and you get to there so it's a it's a slightly different version to where you ended up um chris with your um the tiff that you sent in um but in terms of before and after you you'll see it's a couple of tiny little changes um, and if anything in the sky if you really want to make that pop go back to your sky layer which has got that nice gradient on it pull that clarity up and you're going to get more of a pop of the galaxy um, than you had before okay um so that's probably us for today we've got one minute left i'm afraid um so we go from this version here of happy sky above a tent um scott's little conundrum of where did the halos come from we got it it's the black and white conversion so hopefully that helps um, Alan's sunset which looks wonderful I, I, I like it don't worry um, but it's just let's see if we can get that um, that peninsula fixed a little bit cleaner 
Um, and then for Brian, yeah, two different takes on whether or not we want to enhance these rocks or hide them, and then adding in a bit more of a, a winter behind it. But we'll send you all those EIPs so you can all have a bit of a play with it as they are now, so you're welcome to tweak some more. Hopefully that helps as well with the backup stuff. Um, remember, and I know it's been quite active this week, I've actually been off of the, the group for a couple of days, unfortunately, been a bit tied up. Um, but do join in some of the conversations on there. Some of the stuff around backup has obviously come from that Facebook group. I know a lot of people are getting a bit frustrated with some of the bugs that they're finding in 21. Um, all I would say is, as you know, um, Capture One have already announced that there will be a new version um, of 21 coming out over the next month. Um, and that's going to bring obviously some changes and hopefully some some tweaks and enhancements that help um, so there we go in the meantime and to the question earlier um, there are obviously those pro tip sessions so there are about 20 minute chunks that cover in detail lots of the tools that we've run through things like sharpening clarity um, luma ranges and so on um, have a look at those and hopefully they'll help and don't forget to send in your images. So you send them on paulreeforlive.wetransfer.com. Um, that gets to me. Make sure you include your name. Also make sure you include either the original RAW or the EIP if you've made some changes. Um, that helps me see where you were going and, and what you were thinking with, with the current um, edits. Um, and then we will see you next week. So next Thursday, um, same time, same place. And in the meantime, that's how to get hold of us. And we'll catch you later. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.